Welcome back, guys. Uh, just realized that we've been gathering for eight weeks now. So, isn't that crazy? We've been, I feel like we just started, and eight weeks have already gone by, and I remember we were, we were in the, the planning phases, and um, and Tom, Tom moved by so quickly. Uh, so we're actually, uh, if you guys have noticed, this morning it's starting to feel good outside. We're starting to move into the fall season, finally. Uh, so hopefully that means cooler weather permanently from now on. Um, my wife actually just started putting out fall decorations, which always gives me anxiety because I'm always wondering, good gosh, how much did that cost? And, and I'm always wondering too, like why, why, do you, why do we decorate for every season of the year? You know, just, this is something that we do, I guess. Um, but of course, we, before we get started, I, you know, you guys will, will come to know this about me. I love dad jokes, so I got two for y'all this morning, just to get us loose. Uh, so the first one is this. How do you make a water bed more bouncy? Add more spring water. <laughs> and then this one's my favorite. So I just found out my father was a mime. He never spoke about it. <laughs> so yeah, dad jokes. They're good for the soul. Um, so let's go ahead and jump to the message. Today we're going to be in John chapter 3. But I wanted to start off by asking y'all a question. The question is this. How many of you, just a show of hands, how many of you have ever changed out old furniture for new furniture? All Okay, wow, wow, cool, cool. So most of us. Uh, so uh, my wife and I, we used to have this brown couch and love seat and actually had like these white or light brown stripes on it. And they're probably the ugliest things I've ever seen. Uh, but we kept them as long as we did because they're super comfortable, right? It's, it's difficult to get rid of furniture that's comfortable, that feels good. Uh, but one day my mom reached out to me and asked, like, hey, Stephen, I have this nice, barely used furniture. Uh, she was actually in the process of moving out of her apartment, so she didn't need them anymore. So she was like, Stephen, do you want these? And so I was like, uh, yeah, no. Um, I mean, who, who's going to say no to free furniture, right? Uh, especially if it's nice. So after adding the nicer couches, I remember thinking, wow, this really makes my living room pop. It makes everything look so much better. But over time, maybe you can relate to this, I stopped noticing it. Like the couches, just like so many other things in my house, began to blend in with the rest of the stuff that we had in our house. The rest of the furniture and, and things hanging on the walls. So I guess it's a sense of familiarity. If we're not careful, the same thing can happen to us when we read scripture. The more we are familiar with a certain text, the more we can assume that we know everything about that said so why do I bring it up? Today, one of the verses that we're going to be going over is considered to be one of the most famous verses in all of Scripture. You know which verse I'm talking about? John 3, 16. Uh, of course, we're going to be going over verses 16 through 21, so it's not just going to be that verse. Uh, but when it comes to verse 16, though, many of you, if I ask... <laughs> And we're not, we're not going to try just for the sake of time, but I bet if I ask many of you, many of you could probably recite the verse from memory. You won't even have to look at your Bible to do that, uh, which is great. The question that we should be asking ourselves is have we overlooked the deeper truths because of our familiarity with it? Because this verse is much deeper than many of us realize more than I realized as I was studying and preparing for, for this. So we're going to go ahead and read it. Um, it's going to be on the screen, and, or you can, if you have your Bibles, you can read along. I'm going to be reading from the English Standard Version. John chapter 3, starting at verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that 
whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Uh, so Jesus is continuing to speak here, and he's continuing his conversation with Nicodemus. As you guys remember, if you were here last week, uh, we were talking about a lot of Nicodemus. And um, so I want to give a, a quick recap of him and who he is. Nicodemus, as you guys know, was a Pharisee who was a religious leader. And according to history, he was one of the wealthiest men in Jerusalem. And he was also a very important figure. He was a, a teacher of Judaism, and apparently he was on the Supreme Court of Israel. And he was likely a very well-respected man. So Nicodemus lived a life that many would have considered back then to be an extremely successful life living. But as important as Nicodemus was, and as accomplished as he might have been, we believe that he was, he was fearful because he had not been reconciled to God. He knew what was in his own heart, in his own mind, more than anyone else, right? And of course, you know, Jesus also called the Pharisees hypocrites, so you know that had to be lingering in his mind as well. But the reality is, is he did not know God. He might have known facts about him. He might have known information, but he did not truly know God. And he was, because of this, he would have been dealing with inner anxiety and fear. Because if you don't know God, then you don't know for a fact if you're going to be going to heaven or not. And so Nicodemus did all that he thought that he could do. And since he was so highly ranked and so highly accomplished, think about it. There were not many people who were around who he could pick their brains, who were more accomplished than he was. But then Jesus appeared. So if you, if you actually look back at verse 2, Nicodemus acknowledges that Jesus is a great teacher from God. And he believes this because no one can do the things that Jesus was doing, performing miracles. So he knew Jesus was set apart from everyone else. He knows Jesus is ranked higher than he is. So Nicodemus must have thought to himself, surely this Jesus can answer my questions to remove the fears that I have. <coughs> Maybe he's thinking, maybe there's one more good deed that I can do. Maybe one more religious thing. One more step I can take to find peace. What he didn't realize, though, is that his entire perspective, his entire worldview, was going to be challenged through Jesus' words. So let's look at back at verse 16, and what we're going to do is we're going to analyze portions of the verse. So we'll start off at the very beginning. For God so loved. So the word love is used in many different ways and probably overused if we're being honest. I mean, for example, I could say I love my wife. I could also say I love potatoes. I mean, we know that that's not the same kind of love, right? Um, there really isn't another word in the English language which can, ex you know, for, for the word love, right? And so that can explain why the word love is overused and often used in so many different contexts, but it's the same word. And so in the Greek, there are actually multiple words for love. The, the first one is eros, which is the romantic kind of love. The kind of love that my daughter is not going to be able to experience until she's married. <laughs> or, you know, 35, give or take. Uh, there's storge, which hopefully I'm pronouncing this correctly. Is it storge? It's, it's almost spelled like storage, but I, I don't think that's right. Uh, storge, it's a familial love. It's like when a parent loves a child, when a sister loves a brother, or another sister, you know, that kind of love. Then you got philea. 
Philea is a uh, friendship kind of love. It's camaraderie. Anytime uh, guys, maybe you can relate to this back in the day when you were single. Anytime you guys asked a girl out and she friend zoned you, she was sticking you in the Philea zone. <laughs> and then you got agape love, which that's God's love for the world. Okay? This is the kind of love that we actually see here in the text. And God is the only one who can show this kind of love, which we'll explain why in a bit. Moving on, so the text says, For God so loved the world. Does the text say, For God so loved good people? What about chosen people? No, it says everyone. It says the world. So this, this is proof that God doesn't just love certain people. He doesn't just love the best of the best. He loves all people, even those who reject him. Even those who would consider, that we would consider to be unlovable. Even those who are deeply submerged in their sin. Moving on. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. So uh, God blessed us with a baby girl, uh, Harper, about 15 months ago. You can see her in the back eating something. <laughs> Um, but I've noticed that I see things differently ever since we had her. I get emotional pretty much any time I see a daddy-daughter moment in movies. I'm officially a softie now. Um, but I can't imagine what it would be like to lose her. Which is why it's hard for me to comprehend how God offered his son so freely to save the world, knowing that his son would eventually be tortured and killed. Many of those people despising Jesus through the process. The more I've thought about this, the more I've contemplated this, the more it amazes me because I can never love anyone to the same degree. Because I would never be able to do what he did. Hypothetically, if and maybe you've heard an example like this before. If my daughter's blood was a cure for some disease that was affecting all of mankind, and you know, if I willingly let someone use her, her blood to, to be used to, to make this, this drug to save mankind, if, if someone approached me about doing that, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, but I, I don't love other people enough to willingly sacrifice. I'm, I'm not capable of doing that. But God did that. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes. So at this point in the conversation, Nicodemus was likely bored, likely shocked. And there's two reasons I believe that is the case. Number one, Nicodemus believed he had to do something to earn salvation or to be made right with God. And that's why him and so many other followers, uh, that's why so many people like him believed that they had to follow a bunch of rules and laws. So when he was told that you can't do anything, you have to believe that went against everything that he knew. That's why Jesus used the analogy of being born again. You guys remember from a few verses back? When it came to your first birth, just asking y'all individually, when it came to your first birth, when each of you came into the world, how many of you had control of that? None of us. It's because it's, it's something that happened to us. Being born again is the same thing. It's something that happens to you. You do not have the power to save yourself. The second reason Nicodemus was likely shocked is that Jesus said, whoever. Why? Because Jews believed that when the Messiah come, when the Messiah would come, he would save Israel 
and punish everyone else. They thought the Messiah would punish the other nations for their sins, their idolatry, their wickedness. They wanted non-Jews, the, the Gentiles, everyone else, to get what they deserved. So when Jesus said, whoever, Nicodemus must have been thinking, why would God do this? Why wouldn't God reserve eternal life for the people who kept the rules? The answer to that question is at the beginning of the verse. For God so loved the world. So let's analyze that word believe for a little bit in that verse. That whoever believes. What does it look like for us to believe in Jesus? Does it mean that we just believe that he existed? That we believe certain facts about them, about him? Is, is that what saves us? Believing information? No. In fact, in James chapter 2, verse 19, it says, you believe that there is one God, good. Even the demons, demons believe in each other. Demons believe God exists, but clearly they're not saved, right? So there must be more to it than that. The type of belief that results in salvation has to include repentance and submission to him. The kind of belief that changes you. That's the type of belief that Jesus is talking about here. And of course, God gives us the ability in the first place to believe in him. That comes from him. And then we'll finish talking about this verse. We'll just analyze the last part. That whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Eternal life. It's not just life that Jesus offers us. It's the life after this life. It's life that never ends. All right, so we're going to stop talking about verse 16. Um, so that way we have time to talk about the other verses. Uh, so let's read uh, verse 17 together. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. So God didn't come to condemn the world. Many people don't actually think this is true. At least they don't think it's true for themselves. I have a coworker who, who told me the other day, they can't fathom how God would love someone like them because the decision that they've made makes them too far gone. And I hated hearing that. Because obviously it goes against what we see in Scripture here. But um, this may not be the case for everyone, but I wonder how many people have believed the lies that they are condemned so badly that there's nothing that they can do to be saved. And if they do come to God, they'll just continue to experience his wrath. This is one reason why it is super important that we are not just sharing our faith and sharing the truth with people, but also familiar with the word of God ourselves. Um, because the Bible teaches us what God is like, his characteristics. We find out that he's, he's a loving father. Um, yes, he deals with sin. He's going to deal with wrath. Or, or, or wrath is, is very much real. Um, but he wants to save us from that wrath. And he ultimately desires for each of us to be saved and, and to be close to him. Verse 18 says, Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already. Because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Whoever does not believe is condemned already. Super important part here. Important verse. What is the text talking about? Well, the word already is key here. When you came to this earth, when each of you were born, 
you were condemned already because you arrived here as an unbeliever. An unbeliever, someone who did not believe in Jesus. Often I hear this claim, and maybe you guys have heard something similar. I've heard many people say, well, I'm a good person. You heard that before? I'm, I'm a good person, so I'm okay. It's very common. And the problem with that, though, is that it's a lie from Satan himself. The reality is, apart from Jesus, there are no good people. Only evil people. But to finish this thought, you know, trying to be a good person, where your your where your good deeds outweigh your bad ones, it's irrelevant. It doesn't matter. It's not someone in, in you know measuring a scale, to see if you're going to be at least fifty one percent good. It's irrelevant. It's not the case, of course, God is aware of you know, what you do against him, but he's, that's, that's irrelevant in this matter. The reason people get this, the reason people will go to hell is not because they sin too much. It's not because their bad deeds outweigh their good deeds. It's because they didn't believe in Jesus Christ. Verse 19. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and the people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. So, if you guys were here the second week that we gathered, we talked about how Jesus is called the light. And scripture calls him light because it describes what Jesus does to darkness. Jesus destroyed it. It can't exist in his presence. Not only that, Jesus sees everything, right? So there's nothing hidden from him, which is why it's pointless to hide anything from God in the first place. Because he already knows about it. But pay attention to what the beginning of this verse says. And this is the judgment. Jesus is explaining why judgment is coming into the world. You ready? <clears throat> the light, being Jesus, came into the world and people loved the darkness. They loved their sin rather than the light, being Jesus. They preferred the darkness. Do you know why people don't believe in Jesus? Why they don't come to him? It's because they love their sin more. And why do people love their sin? The darkness. Well, for starters, if for starters, we all have a sin nature, uh, meaning we are very susceptible to temptation to sin. If you don't have Christ, there's no opposing force to those temptations. And many of you have probably experienced too, if, you, if, you, if you're not in scripture for a while, if you're not uh, praying and, and having that close intimate relationship with him, you notice that over time it becomes increasingly easier for you to fall into a temptation. Why? Because you're away from the light. People love darkness because they don't realize Jesus has so much more for them than whatever that sin offers. As we know, sin only corrupts. And it never offers the truest thing. It, it never offers anything that can give you life or fulfillment. It always lies to you. Let's look at verse 20. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. 
Uh, so I want to be very careful with what I say here because of our younger audience. Um, so you're going to have to read between the lines with what I say. Okay? I recently watched this video by a journalist who was doing some undercover work. Uh, this journalist hired a, a girl who was, you know, he was, this girl was working for the journalist, uh, and she pretended to be on a date with the school teacher. And this girl was filming this teacher as they conversed back and forth while on the date. The teacher admitted that something pretty shocking that he was wanting, he was trying to do with students. Um, the, the teacher admitted giving, admitted giving certain items meant for pleasure to middle schoolers. You know, the kind of items that adults may use when no one's watching. You know what I mean? The journalist who hired that girl to get the footage, he actually later on, he, he approached the teacher. And when he did this, the teacher was freaking out because he knew he was caught. And he actually ran inside the building and locked himself in there to try and get away from the journalist. Why would the teacher do this? He didn't want to be exposed. Isn't it funny that how even those who don't know Christ, they still know their sin is wrong. But they hate the light because it exposes what they do. Mm -hmm. Verse 21 says, But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out by God. So do you know why, uh, why Nicodemus came to Jesus? He wanted to know what the truth is. He wanted to know the truth. So when I read scripture, I've noticed over the years that certain words tend to pop up more, more often. You know, generally if you're in a, you know, when, if I'm in a certain season, I'll, I'll keep seeing a certain word pop up over and over again. And so whenever that happens, it makes me think that God is trying to get me to pay attention for a reason, right? The word for me this past year that keeps popping up is truth. The thing about truth is that it doesn't change, even if it makes people angry to hear it. The truth often can hurt, can often be very painful, um, and many of you have probably noticed people don't primarily seek truth anymore. What do we see? People primarily seek, they phrase it, their truth. You heard that before? Like, yep. My truth, or his truth, or her truth. What they're seeking after is to feel good. They're seeking after good feelings. Our culture, unfortunately, is so mentally weak that many would rather believe the lies if those lies make them feel better. Mm -hmm. So as you guys know, in John 14, 6, one of the titles Jesus has is that he is the way and he is the truth and he is the life. So we shouldn't be surprised to see people hate Jesus because many prefer to believe their made-up truth. Which isn't really truth, it's just lies that they call for truth. But focus on this line right here. But whoever does what is true comes to the light. Um, I believe those of you who kept coming back here to TFC, maybe one of the reasons why you, why you keep coming back is, is because of this, that the light is going to shine bright here. It's going to be di very difficult for any of us to, to live in sin because God's word, I pray, is going to continue to penetrate our hearts regularly and lead us to repentance. But as we finish up, I was trying to think of something that 
tied all of this together, and then it hit me as I reread verse 20. But I'll ask, before we go to, back to verse 20, I want to ask you this. Who or what do you love most? Because whatever or whoever that is, is what you will pursue most. If you say it's Jesus, your life should reflect that. If you have secret sins, you know, the kind of sin that maybe no one knows about, maybe even your spouse doesn't know about, you need to be asking yourself this question. Who or what do you love most? Because you cannot love Jesus and your sin. It's impossible. But the part that hit me this past week was when I read verse 20, like I mentioned. Change the word liked for Jesus. So it would read like this. For everyone who does wicked things hates Jesus. That's dumb. Like we said earlier, you cannot love both Jesus and your sin. It's impossible. So let us examine ourselves. Who or what do you love most? We need to remind ourselves, like, we need to ask ourselves, who do we want to worship? Who do we want to put first? Because Jesus doesn't want just some of you. He doesn't want just most of you. He wants all of you. Do you know why he wants you? Because he loves you. And here's the best thing for you. Father, we're thankful that you would draw us together. <clears throat> we're thankful that your word penetrates hearts. We're thankful that you even gave us the opportunity in the first place to believe in you. And that you pursued us first. Father, there's nothing else in this life that compares to you. So, Father, if any of us in here have sin that we haven't dealt with, that we haven't given to you, I pray that we offer it up to you and also that we strive to fall more in love with you, Father, because the promises of sin it never fulfills. that the wages of sin is death. It doesn't lead to anything else. Father, I thank you for bringing us together. Thank you for your word again. And I pray that above all else, that we seek your face. You're worthy of our worship and our praise because of what you did on the cross. God, you say this in your holy name. Everyone said, Amen. Amen.